Good morning, still. Thank you, Derry. I have to follow the kid president. I don't know. That's not a very good thing. So in 1998, Stephen Jay Gould, who is an eminent evolutionary biologist and an influential public science writer, he published an article in the Washington Post entitled Planet of the Bacteria. And in that article, he outlined his reasons for considering microbes as being the most important organism or group of organisms on Earth. And in fact, he went as far as to say that humans are merely guests on a, in a microbial world. And in his article, he, had, he outlined five reasons why he considered microbes to be so important. I'm only going to bore you with three today. The three I think might be most important for this presentation. So the first one, his first reason was ubiquity. Microbes are everywhere. And there's an awful lot of them as well. In fact, it's estimated, but no one's counted, but it is estimated that there are one nonillion microbes on the planet. Now, I had to look up what nonillion is, and it's a one with 30 zeros. That's an incredible amount of microorganisms. And so much so that if, you, if each microorganism was a two-cent coin, and you stacked all those two-cent coins on top of each other, the stack would be a trillion light years high, which is bigger than the universe. So it's an incredible amount of microbes. The second point that he made, and it's linked to the number of microbes, is their utility. Microbes are incredibly useful. In fact, life on the planet would not exist without microbial activity. And microbes are required for all of the important biogeochemical cycles that recycle the, limit, the limiting resources that we have on this planet. So they, they recycle carbon, they make oxygen, and they, and they fix nitrogen. So microbes are useful. And the third reason that I want to talk about and mention is time. Microbes have been here a lot longer than we have. So the planet is estimated to be about four and a half billion years old. Uh, and the first single-celled microbes appeared around two and a half to three billion years ago. And multicellular animals didn't arrive till about 500 million years ago, and humans were only here 300,000 years. So we've all evolved in an environment that has really, for a long time, been dominated by and sculpted by microbial activity. So with that, it's probably not a surprise that we are never alone, that we are hosts to millions, if not trillions, of microorganisms. And, thank you. and in fact, um, there are about a hundred trillion, I should say, I work in, well, I'll say first, there are about a hundred trillion bacteria living in us and on us. And about most of those bacteria live in our gut, in our gastrointestinal tract. And just to put some context on it, the totality of the microbes living in our gut weighs about 500 grams. So that's about a bag of sugar. So you carry a bag of sugar worth of micro microorganisms in your gut. So I work in a uh, the APC Microbiome Ireland, which is a government-funded, a Science Foundation Ireland-funded research centre, a research institute based here in UCC and also in our partners Chagask and Moore Park. And the aim of uh, APC Microbiome Ireland is to study our microbiota, particularly as it plays roles in the health of, of humans uh, and animals. Now, luckily, we have, or it's often long been considered that we have a largely beneficial or friendly association with our microbiota. And, and this was first uh, published or put into, into the community or expressed by this gentleman here, Ilya Mech Mech Mechnikov, who was a Russian scientist working in the Institute Pasteur in Paris in the early, 19th, early 20th century. And some of you might know, or some of you should know Ilya Mechnikov because he's the father of immunology. And he got a Nobel Prize in, uh, for physiology and medicine in 1908 for discovering macrophages, these immune cells that eat bacteria and keep us, keep us, keep us well. But Ilya Mechnikov also had an interest in how bacteria benefited human health. And he was aware of a, a group of Bulgarian peasants who appeared uh, to live longer, relatively longer than the rest of the, of the population. And he studied this group of people and he attributed their longevity to their daily consumption of fermented milk. Uh, and they produced this milk using a bacterium that we now know as Lactobacillus bulgaricus. And this is a bacterium that we use to make yogurts uh, today. And so he published this work in 1907 in a book called The Prolongation of Life 
Optimistic Studies. What a great title. Uh, and, in this, and in this book, he outlined his reasons for thinking that fermented milk was the elixir of life. And he was so convinced by what he thought that he made his own fermented milk and consumed it every day and even convinced his friends to do it. But it's 100 years now since Mechkinov and his original observations. And we now do, thankfully, we are now beginning to get a better understanding of what the microbiota does for us. And more specifically, what specific members of the microbiota living in our gut do for us. It's a great unknown still. But just as an example, this is a bacteria called Acomancia mucinophila. No, no one will have heard of that bacteria, and that's only because it was only recently discovered to live in our gut. And in the population, you can have as much, people, individuals can have between 3 to 5% of all the bacteria in their gut could be Acromancia. And what we found is that Acromancia is inversely, or the levels of Acromancia are inversely correlated with body weight and with the incidence of type 2 diabetes. So the more Acromancia you have in your gut, the more likely it is that you will be lean and the more likely that you have a reduced incidence of type 2 diabetes. And indeed, they found a protein produced by this bacterium that is responsible for pretty much all of these beneficial traits, leading to the potentially exciting possibility that the microbiota might be druggable. We might be able to make drugs from the microbiota to improve our health and well-being. So we do know that the microbiota, or changes in the microbiota, can lead to changes in health status. And, as I just mentioned, we now think it's reasonable, certainly through these prisms of possibilities, to imagine that the microbiota in our gut could be a therapeutic target for treating a whole range of different human diseases. One of these potential fields uh, that's very exciting at the moment is, is, in the, is in the area of mental health. And uh, we're all familiar with the feeling of anxiety. I am experiencing it at this very moment. And, uh, but anxiety is good in, 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 in itself. It's an adaptive response that we have to potential danger. It helps us to cope with changing environments. But of course, anxiety can be bad too, and if it begins to affect in any significant way our day-to-day -day life. And it's a startling statistic that about 15% of everybody will experience at some stage during their lifetime an episode of what we call pathological anxiety. And pathological anxiety can, in some forms, be associated with depression and also with uh, constipation, which suggests that there might be some link between the gut and the brain. Right? And this, again, isn't new, um, but if you delve back into the literature, and this was a paper published by a Gordon Porter, or George Porter Phillips, a clinician in London in 1910 in the Journal of Mental Science, the treatment of melancholia by the lactic acid bacillus. And in that paper, he rather prophetically states that melancholia with its attendant constipation and faulty alimentation lends itself at once to a diet dietic form of treatment. And this is probably one of the first papers to describe what we now call the gut-brain axis, this connection between the gut and its microbiota and brain activity. So anxiety is a feeling, and it's the brain that controls our feelings. And the brain is an incredibly complex organ, and we have no real idea of how, how it works, how it processes information to form memories, thoughts, and feelings. And I'm sure none of you know why you can't remember what I said five minutes ago, right? Because the brain is, is complicated. But at a molecular level, what we do know is that brain activity requires neurons. And neuronal activity is quite simple at a molecular level. It's an interaction between a protein receptor and a small molecule called a neurotransmitter. So at the molecular level, it's neurotransmitters which controls our feelings. And one such neurotransmitter is called GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid. And reductions or reduced levels of GABA in humans has been linked to depression, anxiety, and stress. And deficits, as I say, deficits in GABA signaling are related to, um, to these conditions. And benzodiazepines, which is a hugely prescribed drug to treat anxiety, actually targets GABA signaling. It enhances GABA signaling to improve the uh, anxiety. Our gut microbiota makes a ton of this stuff. 
It's a simple metabolite made through the decarboxylation of an amino acid called glutamate. And as I said, our microbiota makes an awful lot of GABA. And in fact, bacteria that live in our gut microbiota are enriched for this ability, which suggests that making GABA is an important function of gut microbiota. So wouldn't it be amazing if the gut microbiota could be influenced to create or to produce GABA to treat, in some way, something like uh, anxiety? And of course, I won't say of course, I, I, but I'm going to mention that we have some evidence from the work done by colleagues in APC Microbiome, this, in APC Microbiome Ireland that this might be the case. And it's been shown that you can improve anxiety-like behavior by feeding animals a GABA-producing lactobacillus. And these treatments have been called psychobiotics, so probiotics with potential neuroactivity. But the, the role of the microbiota in producing drugs goes way beyond neurotransmitters. Uh, there are over a trillion bacteria in our guts, and each of them is a metabolic factory. And they can undergo, or they can transform molecules that we eat in our diet, or we take through medication, into a whole range of different compounds with various different effects on our health. For example, carnithine is a, is a molecule found in our diet in red meat, and our gut microbiota can convert carnitine into a molecule called trimethylamine, which is then converted by our liver into a molecule called trimethylamine, trimethylamine oxide. And an increased level of trimethylamine oxide has been linked to cardiovascular disease. Similarly, bile, we produce bile in our liver and it's stored in our gallbladders, and every time we eat, a little bit of bile is squirted into our intestine to help us solubilize the fats in our diet. The gut microbiota can take that bile and convert it into hundreds of different types of molecules which can affect host signaling regarding our metabolism, tumor genesis, uh, and inflammation. And indeed, clinical outcomes can be affected by the microbiota. The microbiota can inactivate or modify important drugs, making some people treatment resistant because of their microbiota. So when we consider that the microbiota is important for human health, what we really need to consider is the composition of the microbiota and the impact that that will have on human health. And thankfully, we can modify our microbiota. We can, to some degree, control it. In the Western world, and it's, and it's diet, I'll tell you now, the secret is diet. If you change your diet, you will change your gut microbiota. It's as simple as that. In the Western world, we have a terrible diet. It's a diet rich in processed foods and fats. And this is linked to increased levels of obesity, type 2 diabetes, cancer, inflammatory bowel disease, amongst other conditions. So it, it makes sense that a bad diet, a bad microbiota, an unhealthy human. Fiber, on the other hand, is associated with a good diet. And a diet rich in fiber and low in, uh, in, in processed foods is considered to be a healthy one. Why? Well, quite simply, it's because we cannot use the fiber as food. When we eat fiber, we are feeding our microbiota. So the microbiota have these enzymes that can degrade the fiber, and whilst doing that, they grow. So eating fiber nourishes our microbiota, and as our microbiota is nourished, it produces drugs and other molecules like short-chain fatty acids, which are all health-generating. All right. Am I supposed to put that up there? because that's my fiber slide, all right? So, we've heard earlier that good relationships are key for a long and healthy life, and I think that extends to our relationship with our microbiota. And a diet rich in various different sources of fiber will ensure that we have a rich and healthy microbiota and that will contribute to our health in the long term. So to finish, just Hippocrates said it best when he said, let food be thy medicine, and medicine be thy food. And remember to mind your microbes. Thank you. <laughs>